done, I think. Maybe. Is there a little icon that shows a little red microphone with a little dash through it? A slash? Yes. Okay. I don't know if they've um, chosen an Unte yet, but Susan or Karen or Doug, would I, either of you be interested? I'm seeing a sure from Karen. I, I would, but my voice is being hampered by allergies this morning. Yeah, no problem. All right, Karen, it is. Thank you, Karen. Should I start now? Um, let's see. Maybe if someone could give us the okay from the temple might be good. I want to make sure everything's ready. Hello? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think we're pretty much ready to go. I know my dad was offering to uh, be Umzeg today. Um, okay. Unless, uh, yeah, unless Karen would like, like to or, yeah. Oh, go for it. Trouble connecting to you. Let me go grab them and then we should be good to go. I'll be right back. Oh, thanks. Yes. How are you doing, Jack? <laughs> doing good. How are you? It's nice doing to hear well. your voice. <laughs> good. Yeah, good seeing you. Yeah. I'll go grab them. Eli, we're gonna we're gonna skip the seven line prayer. Um, would you like we can we can do it? I'm sure. You think we should do it, Jules? Okay, I guess I'll get going. Ong or gen yu ji nu chang sham Pema ges ar dang po la Yat sen cho ji nyo dru ni Pema jung ni je su dra Ordu kadro mang po kor Keg ki jesu dag drup ki 
Shinji Lob Shir Shag Su So Guru Pema Siddhi Hum Om Organ Yogi Noob Chang Sham Pema Gesardang Pola Yat Sen Cho Ji Nyo Druni Pema Jung Ni Jesu Drag Kordu Kadro Mang Po Kor Kegi Jesu Dag Drupki Shinji Lok Shir Shek Su So Guru Pema Siddhi Hum Hum Organ Yogi Noob Chang Sham Pema Gesar Dong Pola Yat Sen Cho Ji Nyo Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. 
from freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults. May I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niratiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Riyadaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem, Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Vulture's Mountain on Rajagriha together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, 
no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I element, and so on, and up to, and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell on the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment it's on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Gate 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 paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokeshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharideva Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokeshvara, those surrounding their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. And now it is my great pleasure to turn the talk over to Jack. Hi, and thank you, Matthew, uh, for being in today. Um, I'm really glad to be here this morning. Um, Mama asked me to do this talk, and originally I was going to be doing a uh, part two of the talk that I did last time on like the role of hierarchy within Buddhism, and then I was going to do part two, which is like um, the role of hierarchy within our lives that can sometimes be a, a negative thing. But today I'm gonna to be talking about um, the basics of de-escalation and conflict resolution. And that's kind of in the light of um, the temple being partially open um, to vaccinated refuge students and kind of how uh, folks who are there um, might have to deal with some challenging situations if someone is to come and want to join um, and not be one, a person who's in that, that group who can be in the temple. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about temple specifically, but really all of this um, can be applied to, to everyone kind of in your own life um, in many different situations. And de-escalation I think is really um, a philosophy that you can come to embody in your life um, that can help um, in all different types of situations, whether that's uh, parenting or if you're a teacher, um, 
if you work in customer service, which oftentimes has really frustrating people. Um, so uh, it's it's really uh, just a way that, that you can um, align yourself with your values so that you can be better prepared to deal with challenging behaviors. So again, my name is Jack and I'm a refuge student of La Magenta and I have been since March of 2019. And I'll be talking uh, about the policy so for vaccinated refuge students um, and that they must wear masks indoors. Um, but again, this can be kind of uh, applied in more of a broader context. And so some of my background in de-escalation comes largely from the work that I've been doing for the last 10 or so years. Um, I started out after graduating uh, college, um, working at a care home for adults with developmental disabilities um, as a caseworker. I moved on to working with youth uh, in the school setting, working uh, with youth who have special needs and then moved on to working with youth in a mental health setting. And now I currently work with adults with schizophrenia, many of whom uh, are homeless and or have just been released from incarceration. So I've worked with a lot of different types of folks, all different ages, um, experiencing all different types of challenges. And so I've had to witness and personally experience a lot of um, other people's escalation. And so I have a lot of experience, um, which has allowed me to come to a place where I feel pretty calm when people are escalating. And so I'll be talking a little bit about some strategies that you can, um, you can rely on, um, but it really comes down to practicing these things so that you feel confident um, that you are capable to engage in a certain uh, situation that's challenging. Um, I also have experience in the, the activism world, um, working, <laughs> trying to work with people on uh, developing like nonviolent communication skills uh, so that we don't just wanna rip each other apart. <laughs> and that doesn't, uh, it doesn't always work, um, but Again, it's just experience and um, yeah, and, and partly through that, I've come to realize that I still very much um, believe in de-escalation and believe in nonviolent communication, regardless of how many times um, I failed or that the situation hasn't gone um, how I would prefer it to go. So my references for this talk are um, some conversations I've had with Lama. I talked with him a couple weeks ago. Um, he wanted me to kind of develop some ideas for the Wednesday night meditation group, which currently meets hybrid in person and online, kind of like the Sunday group. Um, and so he he wanted me to think about uh, ways that we can approach um, conflict if it does arise with someone who wants to come inside, um, who's not part of the vaccinated refuge group of, of folks. So as we were talking, he, he made it clear that he would prefer for us not to contact law enforcement if things were to escalate. And that's also something that's very important to me is, you know, how can we prevent escalating ourselves to the point where we feel that we need to have um, backup from, from forceful, uh, from, from law enforcement. Um, and so this is really about developing skills so that we feel confident, that we feel that, that we can rely on ourselves and our Sangha members or our community members um, to approach difficult situations. And I also relied a lot on this text. I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of bright, um, but it's the Bodhisattva Vinaya of Lions Roy Dharma Center. And this is like a super precious text that Lama wrote. If you don't have it, make sure and pick one up. Um, it's really special and it's, you know, it's written in, in his own voice. So I feel a lot of connection to that. And then also Working with Anger by Tubton Children. This is an excellent book. And um, really she talks a lot about how uh, 
it's not about the other person's anger. It's about managing ourselves. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that. And then this book, Beyond Survival, this is kind of um, just giving me some inspiration. It's a book that comes out of um, the transformative justice movement in uh, kind of the activist lefty world. Um, and it's really how to, again, how can communities work with sometimes very difficult situations, even you know domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, these types of things, how can we navigate those situations and hold people accountable without having to use the state, having to use law enforcement or the criminal justice system. So it's really, that's uh, an inspiring text for me. And then lastly, a very short page by Lama. I don't know if you can see it, but um, how to have fun in the Sangha sandbox. <laughs> so we'll be talking a little bit about that too. So first off, I think what's really important for de-escalation um, and that really helps de-escalate ourselves is centering yourself in your ultimate goal. And so as people in here who are, are Buddhists, that goal is to, uh, to be of benefit to others and to support others in their own liberation. And so in some ways, Buddhists really have kind of like an advantage with de-escalation because we're, we're learning how to calm our minds. We're learning um, how to see other people's inherent goodness. And that can be an incredibly preventive measure when it comes to other people's behaviors and potential escalation. So some things that I'll be talking about throughout the course of, of this talk and, and when I talk about techniques, um, some main things that, that we want to consider as Buddhists um, is that we really want to work on doing no harm or at least as little harm as possible. And I think when it comes down to de-escalation, it's really all about safety. Um, so that's both for ourselves and for the other person. And so our main goal in, in, de in de-escalating is to create kind of like a safe container, um, both for ourselves and for the person who is escalating. Um, and we'll talk about strategies for creating that safe container in a little bit. And then the second kind of key element is that everyone has Buddha nature. Um, but of course, we are all very different. Um, and we've come to a variety of very different conclusions about how we want to be in the world um, based off of different causes and conditions. Um, and something that Tupin Chodron talks about in, in her book, Working with Anger, is that these kind of various feelings and emotions and even the causes and conditions that lead to those things are just like clouds. They're like clouds that are covering up a clear sky. And when those kind of obscurations are moved, then we can see the kind of the clear sky-like nature of, uh, of our Buddha minds. But that takes a lot of work sometimes. And that also happens in relationship with other people. So I think that's one kind of really exciting thing, something that gets me very excited about conflict resolution is that we, in, in our stability and in our sharing what we think is a, a, a more appropriate way of, of engaging, we can help the other person um, change their behaviors and become a, a kinder, safer person. So something that, um, that we can do is we can kind of, she encourages us to imagine Let's imagine this other person who's escalating. Maybe they're upset that they can't come inside because they're they're unvaccinated or they're not a, a refuge student. Or, or out in the world, maybe there's someone at the grocery store who doesn't want to wear a mask and is yelling in people's faces. You know, that's the type of situation where we can imagine what if I was raised in that person's family 
had experienced everything that they've experienced. As much as I can't stand what they're doing, would I possibly end up doing the same thing? And so not that that behavior is acceptable, it's not, but can we come to recognize that these things are part of someone's causes and conditions that lead them to behave in this way? And we can have a little bit more compassion to engage with the situation. And lastly, actually, sorry, um, is that we have to do a lot of medication and study to come to that conclusion. But I think that even just a little bit of awareness of Buddha nature um, can be super powerful in preventing escalation itself. So by trusting that other people do have Buddha nature, do have inherent goodness, then that in itself can be a way to kind of de-escalate someone by just showing, being, having that presence of, I see you, I see that, that you are someone who has, has that nature. Um, so that is something that I think can be felt by others when you engage with them. And then lastly, kind of a key point is that um, we have a responsibility um, as Buddhists uh, to model appropriate behavior or less harmful behavior. Um, and where that comes from is that Buddhism is a teaching model. So the Buddha can't heal by, uh, you know, putting his hand on someone or, you know, we can't heal by like planting a chip of our knowledge into someone else's brain. We have to teach people. And part of that is by modeling the behavior that, that we think is, is more beneficial. So I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint because um, I like PowerPoints, I like information. Um, so if you can see that maybe, Karen, if you can get me a thumbs up because I can see you, you got it, okay. And I'm going to, whoop, slideshow from beginning, there we go. All right, so basics of de-escalation. Before we get into some techniques, I would love it if someone could volunteer to read these slides. So maybe one person to read the first and then another to read the second. These are just some lovely little short uh, things that Lama has written about how we're trying to engage with community. Um, so if someone could volunteer to read this slide, that would be wonderful. All right, Karen. Bodhisattvas say, I am willing to consider that. I am willing to consider your point of view. A Bodhisattva's daily mantra is, oh, they did it that way. Bodhisattvas are good mirrors. They are here to help others see themselves. Thank you. All right, someone else. How about in the temple? How about Patty? I'll do it. Okay, Doug, thank you. How do bodhisattvas settle disputes of differences, hurts, and harms? Bodhisattvas understand differences, hurts, and harms are to be expected. This is the learning planet. Usually it's, oh my God, how could they blah, blah, blah. So we should really expect things to go wrong. We shouldn't think nothing's going to go wrong and then feel surprised. I like that one. All right, Patty, I'm going to pick on you. Can you read the, this next one? Do you have a mic? Or actually, if you can't see, that's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to spread out the talking because then that gives my voice a rest, which is good. That's okay. How about I do it? Because I think I uh, it went back to, 
Okay, yeah, I'll read it. So bodhisattvas, oops, there we go. Bodhisattvas expect difficulties, look for problems, and help people that don't want to be helped and can't be helped. Bodhisattvas put themselves in the middle of things. Buddhists can't transfer realizations or wash away sins. Buddhas teach. All right. So this slide is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of our time together. Um, and it's all about how do we create safety with our body, our speech, and our minds. So before we get started, I think it's really good to acknowledge that while it's very important to be prepared for challenging situations and people who are presenting with challenging behaviors, it's really important to also not be paranoid. So while we come to the temple and we're creating a safe space, we want to be aware that these types of things can happen, but we don't want to be in a state where we're expecting it to happen all the time because that's not a comfortable place to be in. So it's good to be prepared, but not paranoid. And I think really one of the big ways that I've been able to do this for myself is again by practicing and by having experience engaging with conflict so that I'm comfortable with it, or at least more comfortable than I was five, 10 years ago, a lot more. So it takes uh, some preparation, uh, reading, it takes practicing and, um, and experiencing conflict to get more comfortable. So that first one there, being confident, assertive, and compassionate. So it's possible to be all of those things at once. And I think sometimes we think that compassion is kind of, well, at least from my perspective, when I've heard compassion, I think kind of soft, um, maybe even a little bit weak. Uh, and, and I don't think of it as an, a confident or assertive thing, but it's possible to be all three of those things at once um, because actually compassion is about creating safety and it's about um, showing, modeling behavior that is going to uphold that safety. Um, and so sometimes we have to be very clear about what safety looks like. And then we have to be firm about setting that boundary. So sometimes we have to fake it a little bit, right? Like fake it till you make it and just practice until it becomes like, how we engage with the world. And I think confidence and assertiveness means that, that you know why you are doing something um, and you're proud to share that with others. Um, and not in like an ego pride kind of way, um, but simply that you know that you're, you're doing what's going to be helpful, what's going to be beneficial for others. And so setting kind of a mandate about, here's who can be in the temple right now, that's about safety. It's not about politics. It's you know not about, well, I don't like you and I like this person. It's about safety. So you know why you're doing it. And then compassion comes from wanting others to be free from suffering. So also seeing someone, if, if someone does become escalated, you can see that when they're in that state, that's a very kind of obvious display of their suffering, right? And it can kind of open our hearts to them if we are, allow ourselves to be opened by that. And it can help us avoid defensiveness. So defensiveness is the opposite of confidence. Um, in this type of situation, we don't need to prove that we're right. We just are telling the truth. We don't need to win. And I think that's another way that we can be very confident is, I don't need to win this situation. I'm just presenting the truth. So another thing, stay calm, even if you don't feel that way. It sounds very simple, but it's, it's hard, right? Um, 
So there's a lot of reasons why Lama tells us that we have to do shamatha meditation every single day. So the, the very kind of basic calming meditation, focusing on an object. And that's because uh, in part, at least in, in this type of scenario, we really need to have a stable body and a stable mind. And we also need to be able to focus in the midst of chaos. So whether that chaos is happening externally from someone who is escalated, or if that's coming internally, maybe when our body responds with like adrenaline and like fight, flight, freeze modes. So definitely practicing shamatha. You can also, if you have a mantra that helps you, you can kind of recite that in your head as you're dealing with a challenging situation. Respect someone's personal space. So you need to maintain several feet of distance and that's so that they feel safe, but that you also feel safe. And then if they're not wearing a mask or maybe if they are wearing a mask, but you're unsure of them, six feet of distance, right? Or more. Um, also being aware of any exit routes, try not to be in a place where you are cornered. That's kind of just real basic there. Listen closely and validate the underlying emotions. Um, so this can be kind of very simple. Maybe it's very obvious that someone's frustrated or angry, upset. Um, validate that frustration. So point it out, you know, yeah, I can see that you're frustrated. This is a frustrating situation. I get it. Um, and no, it's really important. We don't have to validate the behavior that the person is exhibiting, like shouting or, you know, just whatever it is. Maybe they're in line at a grocery store and stomping their feet or whatever. Um, so we don't have to validate the behavior that's inappropriate, but we can validate the feelings because that is what's gonna kind of open the person up to hopefully being able to deescalate themselves because then they feel heard. That's, that's what's really important. Offer choices. So this is one that parents and teachers are, are probably very familiar with. Um, so rather than imposing limitations on people, um, we want to empower them to make choices within the safe options that, that we've kind of determined. So right now, at least with the temple and like the COVID policy, we really don't have many options. Um, so it's kind of really just the option of, we would love for you to join our programs online. We have teachings and meditations over Zoom almost every day. You can choose to join us there. And when the temple opens back up, eventually you can choose to join us once you're vaccinated. So having, presenting it as an option rather than you can't do this. That's really important. Um, and then of course, you know, letting people know, we'd love for you to be part of our Sangha, um, but this is how you can be part of our Sangha right now. So related to that, setting clear boundaries and trusting that you are right in maintaining them. So trust, trusting the Dharma. And um, so as above, you, you really need to be clear on the policy and know why you are implementing it. Um, so it's there like not as a limitation, uh, but to protect our community and the rest of the world. So you really have to know deeply that this is to reduce harm to others, regardless of someone's kind of momentary uh, impermanent frustration. So they might be feeling like they're harmed right now, but, but really what that is is kind of momentary frustration so that other people and, and everyone else, including them, can be safe. Um, so think of, you know, maybe think of a time when you've been an aggressor in a situation, you've been escalated. And imagine, like, did you know the boundaries of the situation? Because I can think of times when I've been really like not well. Um, very angry person. And that was largely because 
I didn't know what my boundaries were and I didn't know what the other people in my life, I didn't know what their boundaries were. And so it just feels scary, right? And so there's a lot of fear that people have when they don't know what's happening. And sure, they might, like people are gonna get angry sometimes about the boundaries that you set, but they know that it's, they know that that's there. And so that's the container that you're, that you're maintaining. So boundaries create safety, even if they might make someone mad. Uh, be non-judgmental. So this kind of goes back to what Tikkun Chodron was saying. Um, anger, frustration, even kind of the causes and conditions, maybe someone's personality, all of these things that have led this person to see the world in such a way, um, they're temporary. They're temporary clouds that are kind of obscuring their, uh, their Buddha nature. And again, that doesn't mean that their behaviors are appropriate, but they do have Buddha nature. So one that's really hard for me is uh, don't try to reason. Don't try and reason with people when they're in an escalated state. Um, our impulse is to kind of like try and correct the person. Uh, we wanna like provide the latest facts, the, the data, um, but has anyone ever seen that work? <laughs> when someone's escalated, especially about something like this, where it's like the vaccine or mask wearing, things like that, does it help to present that person when they're in an escalated state with the facts? It just does not work. In fact, it makes people more escalated sometimes. So oftentimes I have, you know, I have conversations with clients who are in a completely not reality-based place in their mind. So they're experiencing psychosis. Um, and it does nothing to try reasoning with them, like to tell them, well, no, you're not Johnny Cash. Um, and this isn't, you know, 1965. It doesn't work. So really you have to kind of go back to that um, validating of whatever emotion uh, you see present there. And so that can really kind of help someone come down to a state where their mind is a little bit more flexible. Um, and then maybe, maybe then they can hear some of that more kind of rational stuff that you've been wanting to say this whole time. Um, so it's really important to tap into their humanity um, by not pushing back on what they're saying and instead finding the truth of their emotions. Body language, have to be aware of body language. Um, so you wanna maintain like a relaxed yet stable position, kind of like in shamatha. Um, so not too tight, not too loose. So you don't wanna be, you know, like rigid with your, you know, fist clench because that definitely like translates uh, in a negative way to someone. Um, but then you don't also, you don't want to be loose, like where um, you, if things did escalate to physical harm, you wouldn't be ready to defend yourself. So you want to be strong and stable. Um, so keep your hands open, no closed fists. Um, have your hands out of your pockets. You want them visible. Um, don't, don't fold your arms over your chest. And also don't puff your chest. So those sound like pretty basic things, but sometimes we get into situations where someone's upset and we automatically just like, you know, we, we start to uh, like assume the position of, of fighting. Um, so you really got to kind of check what your body language is sharing. Um, really important, don't take things personally. So especially in a situation where you're needing to kind of set a limit or a boundary, um, know that what someone says to you in a state of escalation is a reflection more of their own mind rather than a truth about you. So you don't need to take it personally. Avoid power struggles and challenging questions. So that's another one that parents and teachers know very well because kids love to challenge everything that, that you say. Um, so don't kind of get into that back and forth, like the bargaining um, 
type conversation. You want to, again, when that comes up, like someone says, um, well, COVID's not even real. Like, why are you doing this? Why? You don't, don't get involved in that. Again, go back to reflecting and validating the emotions and remind them kindly of the limit of the boundary. And this one, um, if you choose not to choose, the whole thing is if you choose not to choose, you choose for me to choose for you. <laughs> and that's a little wordy, but it's actually, so um, this phrase comes from play therapy. So in working with children, so children kind of up until like 10, 11, um, but the general idea can be applied with anyone. So basically, like let's imagine a child is doing an action such as like painting on the wall. Um, you give them more appropriate options. So you can choose to paint on the canvas or you can choose to paint on the paper. And if after several times they don't choose one of these options, then you say, if you choose not to choose, you choose for me to choose for you. And it's wordy, but the purpose of it is to redirect the person to their own choices, that they are always, no matter what they're doing, they're making a choice. Um, and this is much more empowering. Uh, so with adults, I wouldn't necessarily say the same thing, <laughs> might kind of bother people. Um, but let's say someone kind of refuses to choose one of the options that we've provided them with. Repeat the policy, um, which is our options for, you know, unvaccinated and non-refuge students. I understand that you would prefer a different choice, but that option is not one that we can provide. Given that, it sounds like you're choosing to leave at this time, and I'm going to close the door. <laughs> so it can be just very straight and to the point like that. Um, and that's, of course, that's if someone is already very escalated, has, you know, made it clear that they're not choosing the options that we provided them. You don't want to, at the gate, be like that, right? Um, it's a, it goes in stages. Um, so it's best, and I think the temple already has kind of like preventive measures in place, such as having I hope signs on the door with the policy so that someone you know comes to the door, sees that, and then they can make their choice. Um, so another way that you can kind of uh, be preventive is have someone like a greeter outside at the door um, to make sure that they're screened for that policy. So accepting the individual's choices. So their choices are not about you. Um, it's not about you. We can kind of let go of the burden of the interaction if it was stressful by um, reminding ourselves that other people's choices are not our own. Um, and hopefully we've even helped kind of plant some positive seeds for that person by modeling right conduct, right speech, et cetera. Um, this one, very important, separate the individual from their behaviors. So this is actually like a really kind of powerful and necessary element of um, transformative conflict resolution. Um, and I think it's one that Buddhists again have kind of a leg up in because we have the training and the Dharma that, that teaches us that all of our ultimate nature is good. Um, and there's these obscurations that cause us to behave and act in ways that are not good. Um, or that are not in alignment with our original Buddha nature. So we can look at certain behaviors and say, that behavior is unacceptable and we can't allow it here. And sometimes we have to be, to be firm with that. Um, some behaviors are unacceptable, but the individual is not unacceptable. And what happens when we kind of acknowledge that is that this whole like array of uh, responses comes into view where we can see, oh, this person came to this conclusion because of many different factors. And some of those factors are things that I might be even be able to support them with, or maybe I can link them with resources that will support them. Um, and so, 
in some ways, it, it really highlights that we have a lot of work to do and, um, and we can help people in developing healthier tools and in healing their own pain. And I think that's what's the really kind of clear distinction between transformative conflict resolution and the criminal justice system, where transformative conflict resolution is all about looking at some of the deeper root causes of someone's negative behaviors, rather than just isolating someone and saying, you are unacceptable, you have to be put away. Um, so knowing that each of us is kind of a bundle of causes and conditions that led them to the way that they are behaving, um, it can help us engage them in a compassionate way. Um, and hopefully again, kind of plant those seeds. So we might not see it during the interaction. They, they might not come around during an interaction and say, you know what, you're right. I wanna do the right thing and I want other people to be safe. They'll probably stomp away and not be happy, right? But maybe in like a few days or a few months, they start seeing other things that remind them that's right, this is not the way that I wanna be behaving in the world. And if we can be that kind of solid person, solid in our ethics, solid in our understanding of the Dharma and of Buddha nature, um, then we can really help plant seeds. Um, so that's another way that we're kind of teaching through our actions of, of body, speech, and mind. Don't rush the process. So if possible, and if it's safe, um, take time to have a conversation with that person. Um, so you might be surprised how much like validation, open-ended questions about their experience um, can really help someone to come to different conclusions. Um, people really just want to be heard. Um, and of course, you know, you might have to, you know, you might have the responsibility of like, well, I've got to go in and start my meditation session. But if you do have the space, um, the time to, to hold space for someone, it can be a very, um, a very healing thing. And remembering your end goal. So keeping bodhicitta in mind, um, we're here to be of benefit to others. And to do that, we have to keep ourselves and others safe. And lastly, you wanna practice these skills in smaller conflicts so you feel prepared for more hostile situations. Um, I can't stress this one enough. This is, this is really important. Um, you can also role play with someone. Um, so maybe you have like a Sangha member who you feel comfortable with kind of talking about these things. Um, practice, you know, uh, a situation where someone is escalated. How would you approach that? How would you talk about it with that person? Um, and so it's nice to just kind of role play that so you feel a little bit more prepared. And we really have to have like experience uh, using validation and reflective statements, open-ended questions, those types of things, um, and setting unwavering boundaries. So there's some situations where your boundaries might be a little bit more flexible, but in this situation, it's a very firm boundary. We can't allow people in who are not unvaccinated refuge or, or and not refuge students. So that's a very firm boundary. Um, so you need to have practice stating that because um, it can it can feel really foreign at first, um, and we're also really used to setting up defenses and protecting our ego. Um, but it's not about our ego at all. Um, there's no need to get defensive. Even if someone is saying something that sounds like it's directed at you, it's not about you. Um, and that takes a lot of practice and probably a little bit of failure. Um, I definitely have, have a lot of experience in failure with conflict res resolution, um, but it helps you um, develop your own voice and feel a little bit more confident in yourself. So lastly, how to have fun in the Sangha Sandbox. Um, treat all with respect. Worry about what you are doing, 
rather than what others may or may not be doing. And I think that one is very important for this situation in particular, rather than worrying about the behaviors of the person who is upset or, or who is escalated, we need to worry about how am I responding? How am I holding my body, speech, and mind so that I can be of service? Um, and lastly, for, for folks who, who are part of the temple, remember that your behavior is the face of lions roar to newcomers. So really presenting ourselves in a way um, that is helpful. All right, so with that, I would love to open it up um, to discussion. Um, I'd love to hear if people have experience with conflict resolution, uh, de-escalation, maybe if there's things that you're scared of or you wanna kind of brainstorm an issue, um, I'm, I'm open to, to anything, but it looks like we're already at 11.58, so it might have to be brief. <laughs> maybe we could do like one or two comments or questions. Well, for me, as a, as a 40 plus year experienced psychiatric nurse, this came like at a great time, just oh, opening a rehab program now. So um, this is wonderful. And everything you said works. It really does. And thank you so much for that. Awesome. Thank you, Carol. Those very You're kind welcome. words. Yes. All right. Anybody else? Challenges? You want to, uh, uh, or you have complaints? <laughs> I think someone's going to the mic, maybe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jack. So um, I work, I work with little children in speech therapy, as some of you know, but um, I was a friend of mine is a school psychologist there and uh, uh, she was saying quite similar things. She's a really young person. I just learned so much from young people because things have improved so much over the years. You know, the kind of training that you younger people receive isn't what I ever got. But um, I just wanted to contribute one one thing that she said that I thought was helpful to me recently. And that was um, because I, I have uh, kids that are, uh, they're called emotionally disturbed. There's other language to describe those type of children, but I try to not read too much about their background because um, then then I get ideas about them before meeting them. But um, but one thing she said was uh, her her suggestion was to describe what the person looks like, like um, like uh, your I noticed that your eyebrows are a little closer together and your posture has changed, mm -hmm. and then to ask their permission. Would it be all right if I, I guessed how you're, how you're feeling? Would it, would it, would that be all right with you? Sort of like an, an asking of permission to make mm -hmm. a guess. And I really like that because I never thought of that actually. So that's just one thing. And so, and then she says, and if they say no, then because the population I work with is highly triggered. And I, I know Jack that you know about this type of population. So, um, but by asking permission, I think that could work with anyone actually, you know. Yeah. Would it be all right if I take a guess how you feel? And then if they say yes, because we could be wrong, you know? I am right. really bad about this, actually. I found out over the years, you know, I'm imagining people are angry and then maybe they're just sad or yeah. scared, yeah. whatever. So, anyway, that's, I just wanted to share that. And thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. And um, that also helps us be like uh, culturally more uh, responsive because. People of different cultures might have different ways of expressing their emotions. And so asking permission, that's so important. So thank you. All right. Jack, um, Jack, so, um, oh, yes. Yeah. Is that okay. you? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you um, yeah. I'm just wondering about your um, suggestions for when you begin this process, let's say you set your boundary, you, you state the uh, the need that is there, the health need, you know, such as the mask or the whatever the vaccine, when that um, becomes uh, more and more of a conversation kind of thing, or the person is not responding at all in one way or another, when is the point where one can and in what manner can one just say this is the boundary and then stop like walk away? If there's a big conflict, how do we 
um, remove ourselves after a period of time in which we're trying to deal with this, is there a, a, the right way to uh, just walk away from the situation? Yeah. Well, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of variable and I think it depends on how much time you have. Um, but I think really starting uh, at the gate, letting people know this is the situation, this is the policy that we have. Um, and so that they know from the beginning, this is what it is. And then if there's kind of challenge following that, starting with those kind of reflective statements, like, like Patty was saying, like, I, I noticed that this is happening for you. Can I make a guess about how you're feeling? And, um, and then it just kind of depends. How much time do you have? Are you willing to sit there with someone and be there while they're experiencing frustration and allowing them time to maybe even kind of come down? Cause that could, that, that can happen. Um, and then you can have kind of more uh, of a conversation. Um, but if you don't have time or it becomes unsafe, you really need to just be firm and say, I'm sorry, this is the policy, this is the option you have, and I'm now going to, to go inside. And, and you can even you know, say that you're going to lock the door. Um, and so I think that's really just, it's dependent on so many factors. It's dependent on the time that you have. But I think the key kind of element is, is I mean, you know, as you start the conversation, sharing the policy and, um, and then ha weaving that throughout. Thank you so much. You're, you're invaluable help for all of us. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Sue. All right, thanks everybody. I, uh, I think we'll hand it over to Matthew for closing prayers. Thank you, Jack. That was very informative. And I'm hoping that none of those conflicts arise. But it's good to be trained because it seems like in life conflict does arise. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chinresic, tense and gyatso, Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all the migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and alternate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading, Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losangdrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Are there any announcements? Patty has an announcement. Yes, I, I have a, a couple of announcements. Um, and they uh, one is that on next weekend, Kenshin Rinpoche is uh, not going to be with us giving the teaching, but Lama Jimpa will be. And uh, so that's, that's very new. And there'll be an announcement about that. And also, uh, but Lama Jimpa will be with us, which is amazing. So we're fortunate in that regard. And then the second announcement is um, Nagari Institute that is um, uh, a place where orphans in Ladakh um, are cared for and educated by our dear friend Geshe Sewang. Um, on our website now, we, we have a place uh, designated for Nagari Institute in the news section, and it's gonna be moved, but currently it's in the news section. And the children, a few of them 
are going to go to the Dalai Lama school and they need sponsors. And so um, if you check out our website and, and go over, you can see what Geshe Sewang and other monks are doing to help these children to uh, have an education they wouldn't otherwise have access to, girls and boys. So I just wanted to mention that. So thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, well, I'm, I have another announcement behind me. No. I just want, want to say that with the parameters that were stated, with the uh, vaccinated um, Sangha members that are wearing masks, you are all welcome to our Wednesday night meditation. I know it's said it's beginning, but meditation, but we do go through uh, many different stages and many helps of each other during this time. So everyone is welcome to the temple who is in those parameters of fully vaccinated and masked and Wednesday evening at six o'clock. So um, Lama said it's open to all of uh, the refuge members. So please join us if you can. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Eli in the booth. Thank you everyone for setting up temple. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Hi, thank you.